Today I'm going to give you guys some tips and tricks to make sure that your cameras live a long and prosperous life. Let's get into it. So basically I got a request to make a video about servicing your film cameras and I thought, hey, that would be a really useful little topic for you guys. Even though I am by no means an expert, there are a few things I thought might be of use to you guys. Before I get into the video, I just wanted to share a bit of a long story. I feel like it's relevant because basically this video is going to be uh, broken up into two parts. I'm going to tell you this horror story. And then the second part is going to be the, the tips. Initially, I was going to separate the two videos, but then I thought it just made more sense to put them together. First, I'm going to tell you guys about a lens repair horror story. Um, okay, so basically one day I was removing a, um, a lens off of my Canon A1. It was the 35mm f2 SSC. And, you know, as you do, once you take off a lens, you replace it with the rear lens cap on it. I did that. And then later when I picked it up to, cause I wanted to use that lens again, I couldn't remove the rear lens cap. It was jammed, it was stuck. And I was like, what the frick? Um, this is weird. But I thought, no big, I'll send it off to my usual camera repair guy. You know, he'll sort that out. Surely it's not gonna be a big deal. He'll get it removed, no problem. Send it off. And then a few days later, I get an email from him and he says, look, I managed to get, you know, I managed to prize off the rear lens cap, but the bayonet mount is damaged so and i was like um right i thought that was impossible because there really wasn't i didn't really do that much to it so i was like all right fine so he said i'm not going to charge you for it but you're going to have to send the lens off to a specialist um in soho and soho basically in london so is kind of the place where the specialist camera film camera repair people are so i thought oh all right fine if you know hopefully they'll be able to do it um, so yeah, he returns it. I still had to pay postage for it. Bit annoyed, but I was like, okay, no big. He says it can be fixed, so um, yeah, I'll trust him. I go over to the special shop in Soho. I go in there and I just, you know, explain what's wrong with it. And then I get referred to this master repair man. He was like a cross between an angry Gandalf and Dumbledore, but he was Italian, five foot five and uh, repaired cameras. So he takes me over to his little workstation, takes the lens and he's like, and his workstation is amazing. It's like really bright, but it's like got tons of tools, all kinds of like magnif magnifying glasses. There's like Leicas, there's Mamiya 7s, there's Hasselblads. There's literally tens of thousands of pounds worth of camera gear right there. And they were just strewn about the place, just like, you know, the same way you chuck your keys on the table after a long day. I was almost too mesmerized to sort of realize the impending kick in the stomach I was going to receive. He takes like a magnifying glass, he looks at the lens. I thought this can't be too serious. You know, it's just, yeah, the beam. I thought it was just gonna be like a, a matter of just adding a bit of lubrication here and there, maybe loosen a screw, you know, it can't be that bad. He spends about 15 seconds inspecting the lens and he, he calls me over, he's like, come have a look at this. And then he points to it, to the bayonet mount and uh, yeah, I look quite closely and there was a, and yeah, there was, there was like a little gap between the barrel of the lens and the bayonet mount. And I was like, oh damn, didn't see that before. To the untrained eye, the lens looked perfectly fine. He said like, did you drop this? I was like, no, I didn't drop this. He's like, well, it looks like it's been bent out of shape. It looks like, and I was like, I definitely haven't dropped this. And he, then he said, well, the only other explanation for this is that the last person who repaired this lens um, reassembled it incorrectly. I was, I was like, oh, for f are you? I was annoyed. <laughs> so he said to, said to me, oh, yeah, I can fix it, you know, and I asked him how much it would cost. A hundred pounds, a hundred pounds. I was like, oh, okay, not ideal. Let me, um, let me think about it. So I go away, take the lens with me and I think about it. I, you know, I, I consider replacing the whole thing, you know, and then I go on, so I go on eBay, I go online, I check out all the film camera stores that I know of, I scour the internet, Google search after Google search, and I literally can find, you know, maybe two or three copies of this exact same lens, <laughs> and like, I didn't realize that this lens was so rare, and the copies that were available were in worse, you know, worse condition than the one mine was in, like, cosmetically. I was like, oh no. And and on top of that, prices have increased since I last bought it. I was like, oh. I was like, all right, screw it. I'll just pay the hundred pounds to get this bloody bayonet mount fixed. I go over to the to the specialist store, the specialist repair shop in Soho, drop off my lens, come back a few days later. You know, the bayonet mount moves again, freely moves, relief. 
I take the lens home and I, you know, attach it to my A1. And then I notice that, oh, wait a minute. In aperture priority mode, the aperture doesn't open further than 5.6. I was like, that's weird. The max aperture is F2, of course. So once again, I go back to the shop and I tell the guy, hey man, and I explain the problem. And he goes, takes the lens, looks at it, and he says, hmm, ah, oh, I know why. It's because it's missing a pin. I was like, what? It's missing a pin? And he says, yeah. The glass guy who repaired this must have lost the pin when he reassembled the lens. And I was like, what? Oh my God. So I ask him, can you just like replace the pin with like another one? You know, can't you just transplant a pin from a different Canon FD lens, you know, and stick it on there? And he was like, no, you can't. This is a very specific pin for this specific lens. You're going to have to get it from another copy of this lens. And at that point, it was like, I might as well just buy another one. But he said, don't worry, you can still use it. Just use it in manual mode. You know, the aperture still works, the aperture ring still works fine. It'll still open up to F2, you just can't use an aperture priority mode. Obviously that wasn't good enough for me. Like the whole point of me using this camera with this lens is so that I can use it in aperture priority mode. I use the Canon A1 mostly because of the fact that it has aperture priority. <gasps> At this point I am, I've just had enough. I'm like, okay, I take my lens, say, I just say, screw it. I'm gonna use it in manual whatever so i go home do some test shots and this is what they look like the photos came out looking like this Ugh, are you kidding me it looks look at like the top and the bottom of the frame they, it's just completely blurry it looks weird it looks like i did that vaseline that stupid vaseline lens effect um but it's built in now into the lens Long and short of this story is that it's just a cautionary tale. Um, you know, after all that, you know, all I did was jam the rear lens cap. And at the end of it all, after literally two weeks of going back and forth with two different repair technicians, all I ended up with was um, being a hundred pounds down and a really rare lens that is now totally useless and and um worthless and not worth repairing yeah so basically the, the point of this long long story is just to sort of maybe help you reconsider buying new cameras or maybe reconsider the size of your film camera collection um because basically when i started out in film photography no one really gave me any warnings about how expensive and sort of how inevitable um maintaining film cameras are so yeah End of part one, how do I look after my cameras? How do I prolong the life of the cameras? Well, firstly, I am a firm believer of prevention is better than the cure. Are you financially able to look after all of your cameras? You know, for, you know, let's say all of your cameras broke. Are you actually financially able to look after all of them to fix them all, you know? Because that's what cameras do. They, <laughs> these film cameras are really old. The, the youngest camera I've got is like 20 years old. They're all going to break at some point. They will break at some point. The question is, are you going to be able to fix them? Will you actually be able to fix them? So that's, some, that's the first thing you need to ask yourself. Maybe it's time to downsize your film camera collection because the last thing you want is an expensive paperweight gathering dust. Firstly, the most important thing is storage. Basically limiting your camera's exposure to dust. Dust is one of the worst enemies of film cameras, of lenses. Um, you know, Basically, you just want to create a barrier between it and dust. So what I do is, is, is that I store all my cameras and lenses either in a silicone um, lens cover or, and or a dust bag. So basically, this just creates a nice you know, physical barrier between it and dust. And basically, the reason for that is because you do not want dust to accumulate in the camera. Once it gets inside the lens, there's little there's nothing you can do about it aside from getting it sent off to get professionally cleaned and that is very very expensive and also kind of risky you know you're taking a bit of risk there you're trusting that the repair technician can actually do what they're going to do and if something goes wrong you're shit out of luck basically you can either keep it in a dust bag or if you have the money and the space you can keep it in a glass cabinet another enemy of cameras and lenses is moisture there are 
lots of little pockets of air in cameras and lenses and should moisture get into these pockets then it's very likely that fungus can develop and once that happens again um, just like with the accumulation of dust the quality of your images can really be negatively affected um, and if you and if you care about resale value then your resale value will be greatly greatly diminished um, even if there's a bit of fungus even if there's a bit of dust the resale value plummets as soon as either of those two things become present ideally keep it in a cool dry place um, the guys from 35 studio made a really good video about um, diying your own dry storage box um, i'll link it over here you should check that one out and i've also heard about leaving lenses in the sun to sort of help prevent or kill off fungus um yeah i'm not sure about that one i've heard that that's also bs so i thought i'd let you guys know about it and just let you guys make your own call on that one another good practice is to simply use them you know you need to be using these things you know there are loads of moving parts in the camera you know the film advance the lens barrel the focusing barrel the shutter button the aperture ring all those things need to be kept moving if you know if you don't use them if they don't move then the lubricants in the camera and in the lens become susceptible to hardening and jamming up you know especially really old cameras from like the 50s i know those ones are particularly susceptible to you know sort of hardening so again that's why i you know i urge people to only keep a manageable sized film collection you know that way you can regularly sort of rotate through your cameras and give them equal attention failing that you can just um, pick up your camera and just shoot a couple of blanks advance the film you know advance it a couple of times turn the focusing barrel you know mess around with the aperture ring um play with the shutter speed that kind of thing just keep all the moving parts moving just uh you know and in terms of batteries um like the battery chamber if you're worried about batteries leaking and sort of corroding the battery contacts what you can do is is just to uh, remove the batteries and you know set them aside uh, when the camera's not in use this one might sound mind numbingly obvious use a strap Okay, guys, like, I know you heard it here first. This is some top quality advice. I mean, whatever, you do you. But if you drop your camera and you say you bend the lens and you bend the lens, the lens mount itself, like, these sort of things aren't repairable, you know? There are certain types of damage that just aren't repairable. Like, if you crack a lens, that's not repairable. You're going to have to get the thing replaced. You're going to have to find spare parts. If you can't find spare parts then you're gonna have to replace the whole damn thing, all right? Use a strap or don't, it's your life, whatever. <laughs> it's also for that very reason that certain types of damage are irreparable. And it's for that very reason, I tend to gravitate towards mechanical cameras. You know, even though I have an OM-1 that's sort of, whose shutter has jammed on me three times, I keep it because it's fully mechanical, you know, you know, touch wood, it hasn't, given me any more problems since those three times it jammed up but i keep it because it's fully mechanical i can always repair it whereas with electronic cameras i stay away from because it's a it's, it's a lottery it's that they're a ticking time bomb you know like these contacts t2s these you know all these contacts t3s like mamiya r z 67s basically any of these hype expensive cameras they're ticking time bombs um you know there are some people there are a few chosen repair jedis on this planet who can fix electronics but it's, i'm pretty sure there's only very specific electronic failures um but again these people are rare electronic failures i can only imagine can be you know i can only imagine are really really expensive all these practices will only get you so far you know sometimes the inevitable happens you know something jams up something gets stuck something gets broken electronics fail and in those situations you're just gonna have to fork up some dosh i, I don't know I'm sorry, you're going to have to fork up some dosh um, and you're going to have to send it off to a repair sort of technician. And when that happens, I suggest you ask your film friends, you know, find out what they do, um, just so that you have a good idea of what is best available to you in your local area. Because, you know, everywhere is different. Everywhere is, you know, I can't tell you what the film repair situation is like in Australia or in Germany. Me personally, thankfully, all the repairs I've had to pay for have been pretty minor, but they haven't been cheap. For example, as I said, my OM-1, the shutter jammed three times. Luckily, I only had to pay for it once. It was £30 um, plus postage. Um, the other two times it jammed, it was covered by my warranty. But if I were to give you a rough estimate as to how much you should sort of set aside for you know, for all these sort of 
um, yeah, as insurance, I would I would recommend about fifty to two hundred pounds, um, depending on how much you can afford to to set aside for each camera. Always have that amount available to you, and ideally for you know that amount for each camera. And if you think that sounds like a lot, well, it's because good camera repairs are not hard to come by. Like good camera repair technicians are a rare breed. And on top of all that, on top of all those things I just listed, it's also advisable to send your camera off for a CLA once every two to three years. And basically a CLA is like a health checkup for your camera. And what it stands for is a, it stands for cleaned, lubricated and adjusted. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I have a couple of cameras that I do a CLA. I'm procrastinating big time on it. I definitely need to send off my Canon A1 and probably my Momia 645 Super as well. If you're in the UK, I can recommend PPP Repairs. I'm not sponsored by him. Um, I've been using him for, you know, a, basically all of my repairs. He's still very affordable as far as camera repairs go. Um, I'm dreading the day when he, when he inevitably raises his prices but as as of making this video he's still very affordable um and he works surprisingly fast for you know for a one-man show so just to wrap things up just to summarize everything i've just said only keep a collection that you can afford to maintain keep it away from dust and moisture use it as often as possible and every couple of years send it off for acla last but not least have a little fun tucked away for repairs and or replacements. Anyway guys, that was a long ass video. I hope you enjoyed it. Plenty more videos come. If you don't know how we do things around here, I upload, I, I upload to the channel twice a week, thinking about reducing it to once a week, just to give myself, just for a bit, um, just to give myself a bit of a break. But yeah, as for now, it's still twice a week. Follow me on Instagram. I post there every day. At Zane Shoes Film, apart from the weekends, just give myself a little break. Check out my portfolio at ZaneReasons.com. With all that said and done, boys and girls, keep learning, keep shooting. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.